Welcome back to part two of this week's episode of Leading Our Own Way, featuring our special guests. Now let's dive right back into the conversation and continue exploring their incredible journey. I mean... Uh, you've brought up your childhood. I think that's probably the, the perfect timing to go there. Let, you, you, you relatively had a, a good childhood until mm -hmm. the trauma hit. Uh, you've mentioned your brothers. Um, at what age did your father die? He was, believe it or not, Andy, he was just 42. He and was 42. How old were you? I was just seven. Wow. So I don't have, I mean, I, I, I have almost no memory of my dad. I have this great picture of my father, which I love. It's he walking me to my first day of kindergarten. Um, but interesting, it's very, very important to, to mention my father um, from, and I hear, I, I learned this from my brothers and my mom was terribly depressed, like depressed like me. Like he lived with it. And he went back then they called them sanitariums, but today we'd call them psych hospitals. Like my brothers have memories of going to visit my father in the sanitarium and there were people, the staff there all wore white and it was, it, it was like one flew over a cuckoo's nest and it, you know, and they brought out my brother, my brother and I were just talking about this the other day, brought out my dad, our dad. And my brother said, that's not our flower. Cause I guess he was like a zombie. So who knows what they were doing? And this is back in the sixties. So um, I, and, and it's important to mention because I, 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 I was in the, I was in, in the, the gene, the heredity, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? I inherited that genetic and his, yeah. my, my, my grandfather killed himself. So oh. that's like, boom, right here. But if you look at my three beloved brothers, there's no depression at all. So what I explain to people is I had like, my genes were like dry tinder for a campfire and the rape came just like explode. That was it. So when I talk about fighting depression for 50 years, like I know when it started. I know, like I know exactly when it started. And it was so that it is, night. Yeah. It's, well, it was, it was more, on more than one occasion. So the first night I meant. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And it just, I, it, I did a, I did a video recently. Um, for, and they were doing uh, really delving into male sexual trauma because there's not a lot of talk about it, there, and, and which I totally understand. I mean, my the only reason I'm able to talk about it is because again I am supported by f extraordinary human beings that, that that have helped me get to this place. This movie, not a movie, I'm sorry, but the video like really went into. Like we went into super, 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 super specifics, which is fine, which is fine. Um, and it's interesting because I can talk about it and, and I'm okay. I don't get, I mean, I can get, I can get teary, which, and I'm, I love to express emotions, but I'm not, I'm not incapacitated by it. Yeah. And I think that comes from all the therapy and support and everything else and, and, and situation like this to be able to just to say and and i'll share later a response <laughs> yeah that somebody that a man did to try to take some of that pain away it's <laughs> get ready to cry because it's it's incredible it's but yeah so Whenever you want to, anyway. Let, okay. Well, let's go to the night, David. Um, I think, I think we, if you're comfortable. And, sure. And I've, okay. Yeah. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you exactly. So, so I had done um, Cub Scouts, which is, you know, the, and then they had a thing called Wee Blows, which is like a little kind of intermediate between Cub Scouts and Boy Scouts. And then, then you go Boy Scouts. So I'd been, you know, I'd probably been to a, a couple of meetings, still new. So, it was um, sometime in the fall, might have been late fall. I was. This was back on the East Coast where I grew up, East Coast, outside of Washington, D.C. And in the and, United States, that's uh, September to December, isn't it? The exactly. Fall. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, pretty leaves and, you know, all that stuff. So mom, you know, dropped me off. And there's an assistant scoutmaster that said, as mom is dropped me off, says, hey, Mrs. Bartley. And mom turns around and says, hey, Mrs. Bartley. You know what? If you like, I I live close to where you live. Which God knows if he knew that. 
and I can take David home. You don't need to come back. So my mother's like, oh my God, thank you so much. And how old so, are you? Sorry. 12. 12. Yep. 12. So mom goes and, you know, I'm happy. And, 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 and Andy, where this whole meeting is talking about this camping trip that's coming up. And the camping trip that's coming up is huge because those of us who are brand new are going to get our first merit badge and it's called a tote and chip. And I'm like, oh my God, this is like going to be like the greatest day of my life. I can't wait. I can't believe it. And so, you know, go through the whole meeting and everything else. And Scott Master and I are in the car and we're talking about the, the camping trip that's coming up and we're driving and we come up to, I'm forget, we come up to a four-way stop. And our car, our, our car, our house is straight. And we go to the right. Now, I'm a compliant being child, adult as it is. And, and this was back in the 70s. And so it's just, you know, it was a different time. You just, you didn't, you didn't question. And, and I remember being confused, but I don't say anything. So we go to a park. And of course, you're not supposed to be in a park after dark. And so we go, and there's a, there's a single light. And he pulls the, the car over where we're in like six or seven parking spaces away from the light, but we're in the darker part. And I remember he stops, and now, of course, I'm totally confused. And he turns off the motor. And then to this day, I can remember the, the energy, the feeling in the car totally changed. And I remember then he looked at me and he said, he pointed, he said, get in the back. And so I go out the driver's side and come around and, and open up the back and, and get in the back seat. And people say, you know, why didn't you run away? Or, I don't know. You know, I don't know. And he, he comes in. Now I'm sitting next to him. And then what he does is, is he takes me and he basically drapes me over his legs. And then he takes off my pants and my underwear. And then he takes matches, unlit wooden matches, and then begins to probe into all parts of me. Matches. Oh, why matches? I mean, why anything but and I don't, you know, I don't have a memory of, I mean, I think obviously I did whatever I could do to check out hmm. while this was going on. And then, yeah, it was just the, like the match thing was just, I mean. The, <laughs> the, the point where you got out of the car to get into the back. I'm not going to lie. I obviously that runs through my mind. It's easy for me to say, "Run, please, David, run." run. But what went on that point of the exit? Did you know what was coming? Did you have any idea from that energy that you felt? This innocent twelve-year-old, yeah. even I mean, I didn't even know what it was at twelve years old. You know, it didn't even enter my head at, at twelve years old what sex was. Yeah. Um, well, I don't recall it anyway. Um, yeah, did you did you have a feeling what was coming, or were you just completely innocent and going, "Oh, he just wants me to get in the back"? No, it was it was more the former than the latter. I mean, I knew something bad was going to happen. I okay. mean, I never would have thought that that somebody could be so sadistic to do something like that. It just so, so I mean, it's such a positive person in your life to it almost an instant split of energy to the dark side, I suppose, wasn't it? Oh my god. Yeah, it just it, it Yeah. So that night after the matches, did it go any further? Well, so then so when he was done and I I, I don't know how long we were there, he said, you know, get in the get in the front, 
you're in the front, and we, and we only have just a short distance to home. And we pull up to the front, and I go to get out, and he grabs me. And Andy, he, he turns me so I'm to like, like about an inch in front of his face, and he said, David, what happened was an initiation, and all the boys go through it, but we never talk about it. And and so then we so then the the camping trip comes. And now this has happened. He's there, but there's all these people. I like, think you know, be fine. Yeah. And what he did was it was in it was in the later part of it was in the evening night. And I remember there was another kid older with him and somehow i got called to his tent which i thought was well, okay well no problem because this ch- this other person's there but as soon as i got there that child left and the same thing happened again and it just so that boy knew what was going to yeah, happen i can't you know what Andy, I, it must some it was there yeah. it i mean felt you would, fishy. You would, yeah you'd have to think about it. Let's go. And you were complicit, you know, or unless, you know, it was just a crazy, you know, he was there and then, and then it was time to leave or something. I mean, I, I think that's what I've chosen to believe over all these years that, you know, I don't, I, I guess, you know, that's enough trauma for me to consider to, to try to process that there'd be one evil, horrific monster, but not something else. So I, I really don't even think about that. I I blame the monster on using the child to get me to that place. Yeah, absolutely. It's just so going back to the first night, that going back into the house, you, your mum's there, um, your family's there. How were those feelings? What did you feel? What did you feel that night? When you did you act as not? I'm assuming you acted as normal. Did you oh, tell yeah, yeah, your mother? Oh. No, 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 no. I didn't tell my mother until I was I mean, like 50, Fuck. maybe 40. It was so you long, lived maybe. with this oh, yeah. for such a long time on your own. Well, and it, it became a repressed memory. So I, not long after the camping trip, I quit. And I don't remember. So by then my mom had remarried and, and my, my bonus dad had nine children. So I really did grow up as, as number 12 or 13 kids. Um, so my parents never, um, um, what's the word I want? You know, I, I don't remember my parents saying, Oh my God, no, you can't quit. You got to finish what you start, you know, and all that. And I don't remember any of that. So, and then, and then Andy, I never thought about it again until I was in college. And I could tell you, like, I remember literally exactly where I was. So I was a resident assistant. So the in, in a in college, St. Mary's College of Maryland, small school in the way 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 southern part of Maryland on the east coast of the United States. And I'm not a scary movie guy in any way, shape, or form. I just I don't don't I don't need that stuff. So the what happened was there was the memory came up. But I didn't, I didn't remember it. So I'm, I rem, but what I recall is being so confused. Like, why, why is this in my head? You know, and it's the images of, of me being sodomized with foreign objects as I'm laying over the lap of somebody. Like, why would I think about that? So it's still, you know, it's because it's been what, eight, eight years. So I was 12 and I was 20, like eight years. I hadn't thought about it at all. So then it reached a point, I don't know how long it was, but here's what I remember. At one point, I realized that what I was thinking was true. And, and Andy, I had a physiological reaction. Like, you know, when you've been like revolted, you know, and like nauseous and you want to throw up. Um, like imagine feeling the worst you've ever felt. That's how I felt. Because there was this like 
like, oh my God. You know, and at first I, I, I challenged my own memory because I'm like, there's no way that could have happened. How could, how could something like that happen? Where did that come from at 20, do you think? I don't know. Because I don't, Why? I mean, if I remember, I mean, at that point, I was kind of, I hit my stride. I was doing really good in school. I was a resident assistant, had my own room. Um, I don't know if I had a girlfriend or not, but I mean, it wasn't, there wasn't any, there was no trauma. Just in, 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 like if we're thinking, okay, well, was there some new trauma that triggered the memory of an old trauma? I don't recall. Hmm. Like at that time in my life, I was pretty happy. That from hmm. what I remember, and now, but the, the, the feeling of revulsion, that's the best word I can use. It just, like, you felt like, I felt like I was dirty. Like, I, I felt like I was soiled. You know, just like, uh, yeah. And then, I mean, and that just, so at that point, that just begins. And I, I would assume this is for all trauma survivors, you know, the if you have a repressed memory, the the point of re, the, the point of realization in which you 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 have to accept the fact that it happened, that just begins like okay, well now what? And you said, you know, what am I going to do? I'm not going to like, oh hey, by the way, I just had this memory. I just remembered that I had been sodomized when I was 12 years old. Mm-hmm. Like that ain't going to come out. This was 1983. Yeah, I graduated in 81. It would have been 83. Yeah, that's fine. So after graduation, then what journey did you go on? This memory's now back. This memory's been, it's not been formed, but this memory's come out. How do you, how does your early adulthood, um, early career, professional life, personal life go into, I mean, I know the tragic happened years years later and we'll, we will meet that mm. point in our chat but what does the next few i suppose decade or so look like for you really just i mean it was pretty normal so i went i left the small school went to the big school to the university of maryland so huge go turfs mm-hmm. um and then uh and then went to work in what's procurement so i became a contract officer so I worked for NASA for a while. Um, wow. Yeah, it was kind of cool. Um, yeah. And then I worked. Then I worked for a small, I think a small nonprofit. Um, so just you know, kind of life was pretty normal. I mean, nothing, nothing. There was no really big, big thing. And then, but so I had really, you know, I knew my eldest brother pretty well because when so he is I'm very proud to say so he did 42 years in the army so enlisted and became a two-star general um in his first three years after graduating from from west point i spent the summers with he and my beloved sister-in-law joan at his first arm post so i really knew my brother but the middle two brothers six and nine years i really didn't know them that well so here we are now end of the 80s they have moved out to California. I had visited, and it was, so whatever age, I can't do the math. It, I thought I was either going to move to Boston, you know, where mm-hmm. my best friend lived and had gone to school and was working as a, as a musician, or I was going to move out to Northern California, and I moved out to Northern California in 1989. And continued work um, in procurement, but then changed careers. Right. And bringing up your brother, you said, uh, was it John who, was it John, your brother that you said was m- like a father to you or is I mean, a father? He really to is you? a father. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he is. To, to, well, I paint mean, that picture for us. Why and how does it, do you feel like he's, is your father? Well, I think, I mean, it's just Andy, because I think again, when our father died, I, if I had to guess, I've never asked my brother this question, but if I had to guess, I think he just, he realized what I would need. And so he had me come be with him in those, those three summers um, when he was brand new out of the, he had enlisted, but then went to West Point 
and then brand new second lieutenant. And so I spent all three summers with him there. And then he continued to be a huge influence. So I think, I don't know. He does something I mean, amazing every day, doesn't he? <laughs> oh, he does. But let me. I think well, people should, I... should know this. Oh, oh my God, my brother! Tell us what he oh, does every day. Every day, never, every day. never, never, never misses. Never. I love this story, people. This is a fantastic story. So, at the end of last year, I fell into the worst depression of my life. Oh. This, this. And it, so it was worse than what you were going through with the jump. I, I think it was. Wow. I mean, every day, what summer? And I, I don't have a memory of this. Summer said, "My summer's my my beloved." Said I would wake up and said, "Please let me die today." And this is when I'm doing all the things that I'm supposed to do. I'm taking my meds. I'm going to counseling. I'm doing all this stuff. It's just like, what, what happened? So I didn't know it. But at that time, I mean, brother, my brother, dad, my father, I'm going to call him my dad. My dad always been a part, but Summer reached out to John and told him. <laughs> what was going on? And so he. He just knew. Knew what to do. So every day. My brother lives in, in, the mid, in the Midwest, so he's a couple hours ahead of me time-wise. So every day when I wake up, I grab my phone because there's a text from my Amazing. brother. And what and type of things does he include in his text? So, okay, you know what? You're going to read today's out. We'll, use, we'll look at today's. Oh, real shit, this. Wow. So... <clears throat> First thing, big day, physical therapy, and I hope and pray it gives you some relief. He, here's the dad part, he will be to do the exercise they give you in between treatments. There's that. Great advice. And then call, calls to Kevin at Beautiful Minds to see if they have, he is a seminarian who did the spiritual sessions you attended. That's a support group that I was part of before. And then call the main office to see if they hold a weekly or monthly past patient maintenance sessions. Final preparation for presentations next week so you have the weekend to spend with your family when they come back from Lake Tahoe. Me, workout, email, and then once the heat breaks, working in the yard. And there's always a motivational quote. <laughs> Thought for the day. Miracles come in moments. Be ready and willing. Love you. Every Beautiful. day. And then you know what will happen tonight? My dad and I will talk on the phone. Every night? Every night. It's like he, a, I look at that as like a protective, oh. protective blanket for you, and, and he he knows that you need it, right? Oh, he does. Yeah, he's just, and he's also, you know, my brother, my dad. I mean, he hold me accountable. You know, so there's when we talk about, so he will say, he will ask me, "Did you call Kevin? Did you do this? Did you do this?" Did you do this? I mean, so it, it is an accountability thing too. It's not just, it's not just the love and the support. It's also, he knows he's, it's what a father does. It holds mm. you accountable to support you, to encourage you. <laughs> and then I have my fiance that, you know, what she has gone through since the beginning of the year to get me to this point. I mean, it's just like, it was not and that wasn't like a raging fighting anything, but just so incredibly depressed. Do you know why you fell into depression eighteen months ago? Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.